the sun is shining. Um, it's going to be hot today. And what we're going to do is let you listen <laughs> to our, <laughs> bless you, Ron, <laughs> is let, let you listen to what's going on with our legislative. Uh, Deb, tell us what's going on. Well, good morning, all. And first and foremost, thank all of our elected officials for being with us this morning and all of you for joining. I see Margaret has joined us. Um, Kansas Gas is our legislative sponsor for this event. Um, did you have somebody that you wanted to say just a few words, Margaret? Yeah, I think Patrick Vogelberg is on the call this morning. He's our new um, uh, Bobby. lobbyist for Kansas Gas Service. Thank you. The words aren't coming to me this morning. I don't know if Patrick's on the call yet or not. I, Are you I there, Pat? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can't see All you, right, but excellent. can hear you. Yeah. Well, hello and welcome everyone to the Northeast Johnson County 2020 Legislative Wrap-Up. As Margaret said, I'm Patrick Bogusberg, Manager of Government Relations for Kansas Gas Service. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone, even though it's virtually. I think we all look forward to the time where we can be back together again. Um, but we're very proud to be a sponsor of this legislative series this year. Uh, it was an interesting legislative session uh, from the abrupt end to the regular session to the 24 hour veto session on signing die to the special session. Uh, it's an understatement to say that it was unprecedented, and I want to thank the lawmakers uh, on this call today uh, who, despite these unprecedented times, continued to fulfill their essential role in the governance of our state. Natural gas is and will continue to be an essential part of business uh, and our Kansas households. As part of our culture of safety, we've closely monitored the coronavirus and have taken precautions to continue to provide safe, reliable service while protecting our employees, customers, and communities. We currently have about half our workforce in Kansas working remotely. For those who remained in the field, we implemented social distancing and hygiene guidelines and added additional personal protective equipment. The One Gas Foundation has provided $70,000 in grants to help nonprofits in Kansas to provide emergency relief assistance to residents impacted by COVID-19. Of that amount, $25,000 went directly to the KC COVID Relief and Recovery Fund. To ease financial burdens resulting from the pandemic, we've offered a variety of options to our customers to make payments or to set up alternative payment plans. Uh, please feel free to direct your constituents who may be having difficulty paying their bills to our CARES website page for information about payment plans, financial assistance, and other resources. And that's at kansasgasservice.com forward slash CARES. And for the legislators, I, I would note that um, please feel free to reach out to me or Margaret anytime if you have a constituent question about their, their service uh, or their uh, payments. Uh, it's Kansas Gas Service's mission to deliver natural gas for a better tomorrow for our customers, for our employees, and the communities where we work and live. Thanks again to the Chamber for this opportunity to sponsor and be a part of this important event. Thank you very much. Patrick, thank you very much for your, your sponsorship. And Margaret, you guys are awesome on doing this. And I want to pass this off to Deb to introduce our, our, our participants. So again, good morning. The logistics of the meeting will be as such. We're going to give each elected official five minutes to tell us what happened or maybe what did not happen in the last session. We are recording this, so if people are not able to join us this morning at eight o'clock, it will be out on our website and you can uh, view at a later time. And then as long as there is time at the end, we will have question time. If you would type your question into the chat, Stoney will be monitoring those and then he will ask the questions to the uh, uh, elected official. And we're going to go in alphabetical order this morning. So we are going to start with Senator Boyer. Thank you, Deb. Good morning, Northeast Johnson County Chamber. It's great to be here and uh, exciting. Up, oh, uh, up, oh, I bet I, uh, am I, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, good. I always forget to check. Uh, 
it's really good to be here today. And I, I, I am sorry, I know we all are, that we can't be together in real life, but Zoom it is, and it's good that we're all being safe and protecting ourselves and our families and our community. And as Stoney mentioned, uh, this was an incredibly tough year. But I will say, it also has been the honor of my life to work alongside all of my colleagues, particularly those from Northeast Johnson County. We really were fighting the good fights uh, for the people of our district and for our state. Uh, and the fact that very little happened, really, it was not our fault. Uh, we, we worked very hard to get things to happen. Uh, for me and for all of us, we know Kansas is such a special place. Uh, and you know, one of the things we know, we value our independence, and, uh, but we also have a history of working across party lines and you can uh, you know, listen to each one of us. That's one of the things that we do to get things done. Uh, and now we're all in the same party, interestingly enough, but uh, we still reach out to others to work across those lines. Uh, one of the things that I've always been proudest of and uh, worked very hard to do this year was to listen to others and to try to build uh, bridges to make positive changes for us. And, you know, that's what we need in difficult times like this, particularly as we're in a pandemic. And that spirit is so important to all of us. And it wasn't always easy to see this year uh, from others. And I'd like to reflect a little bit uh, as uh, today is my last time to appear before this great group uh, as a, a state legislator. Uh, my Senate time will come to an end uh, in the state Senate. And I, I wanted to talk about a couple things that have happened. Uh, one at the beginning of my term, uh, time in the legislature and then this last year. And one of my, when people ask me, what's your favorite bill? ever, that is the, uh, was being able to vote and pass the Clean Indoor Air Act. And what a gift that was to our state and to our community, uh, because it was a great piece of health legislation that helped all. And it really mattered to not only the adults, but, but the children of the state and helped reduce lung disease, pulmonary disease. And, you know, what was really particularly great about it I said we cooperated, we worked together and got that done. And I, I do want to give a shout out to my, uh, my predecessor, Senator David Wysong, who then was followed by Senator Terry Huntington. That was David Wysong's bill. And it didn't pass until he had already left. And that's sometimes what it takes. It takes years and years of time, sadly, for very good legislation to pass. So, um, here we are now at the end of my time in the legislature, and we had this incredibly important health bill to pass, uh, something that I was an advocate for since the beginning, and that was Medicaid expansion. And this, this body has always asked for us to be in favor of Medicaid expansion because it's such an important tool for our families and such an economic need for people to be healthy. And I was really heartened that, again, it was a bipartisan effort for people to come together uh, and work across the aisle to get the votes uh, to get a bill. And then we had a great uh, opportunity that the House passed the bill uh, last year and, and did some very uh, careful, shall I say, uh, finagling uh, to get that bill to the floor and that it passed. And we were so close to getting this done uh, this last year. Uh, that bill sadly sat in the House Health or the Senate Health Committee, of which I was the ranking member. And Senator Petty is also a member. And ultimately this year, that committee we only moved through one bill, one bill. It was not Medicaid expansion. That actually had to do with coronavirus and something we desperately needed. But that was the only bill that had to do with health that went through the health committee that this year that was allowed to pass in the full Senate and go to the floor for a vote. We had the 21 votes. We knew that we could pass this, but Republican leadership stood in the way 
and did not let us to have a vote. And so once again, sadly, we come together today and say it has been done. But I will tell you, uh, I'm not giving up. Now, yes, I will be in the state legislature, but none of us should give up because every year is an opportunity. And if we've learned anything, anything at all during these months of coronavirus, it's that we need affordable health care. And Medicaid expansion is one of those ways that we can get it to the people. Our economy needs that, our families need that, and we need to be continuing to persist in that uh, press, press to get that to the finish line. So, really, really, it is time. Well, I just, I am at the end. I just want to say thank you. Um, I always have used my voice to help the people and stand up for the people and particularly care about what we get done in Johnson County and have really valued the work with uh, the Northeast Johnson County Chamber. So I just have to say, be sure, wear your mask, wash your hands, be uh, socially distanced because this virus is here to stay for a while. So thank you. Look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, there's no questions in the queue. Is there anyone that wants to ask a question? I'll give you five seconds. Nope. I'm going to override you, Tony. We're going to let the elected officials talk first, and then we'll do questions. Sorry. And then we'll do questions. Yes. <laughs> All right. We're going to go to Representative Clayton. All right. Well, um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having us here, albeit virtually. It's nice to sort of see all of you. Uh, I was looking at my calendar, and the last time we did a legislative update was December 13th, and I was thinking about how incredibly different that was and how it's been like a thousand years have passed since then. So um, I am not going to be talking so much about what we did as about what we are sort of looking ahead to. So uh, when my colleague and I discussed who would be hitting which subjects. Uh, but I got tax and budget, so you know, happy news. But um, but honestly, there really is slightly good news ahead. We're doing better than we thought we might be. Um, now, first, I do want to talk a little bit about the unemployment system and some of what we're dealing with there, because uh, we have had some major problems with that. Uh, a lot of this is because we have a very ancient mainframe, or maybe not ancient since it was put, a, put in about the time that I was born. So, you know, a, a healthy, well-aged mainframe um, that's, that's mature, right? So, but in any case, so dealing with that, we've had to look for, the governor's staff has looked for people who are uh, well-versed in uh, sort of old school programming, like think like COBOL programming. So we've gotten those new programmers on and we've also hired some more people to help handle calls because it has just been an old system that was not properly funded because no one wants to vote to fund computers, they want to vote to cut taxes. So when you don't play the long game, you deal with things like this. Um, so to just give you some numbers, our unemployment rate in February for the state, not for the county, but for the whole state was 2.8%. And in April, it went to 11.2%. Uh, if we look at people who are actually receiving benefits, uh, Johnson County, and this would have been like as of uh, claims as of July 5th, Johnson County, for once, uh, we got beat by Sedgwick County. We're usually number one in things, but in this case, I'm happy to take second place. We currently have around 11,000 claimants right now uh, compared to Sedgwick's, which has about 23,000. And of course, most of our unemployment is taking place in the manufacturing industry, so this is going to make sense. So as we sort of look at our uh, state general fund receipts, um, those have, you know, you know, initially they were about 1.1% above our final adjusted rate from our February, excuse me, from our April 20th consensus revenue estimating group. Um, and, you know, things were going fairly well, but our, you know, receipts have dropped a bit. And in April, the governor did have to, um, have to do some allotments or rather she had to do them fairly uh, recently. So those, we were about 653 million in the red. Uh, but the good news is, is that we are actually coming in for fiscal year 20, we're coming in well above the estimates and um, the people that I've spoken to with Department of Revenue have said that the first half of July is looking good. 
Now, there are some things to keep in mind because, uh, guys, we're not really going to know much until the end of the month because, you know, we moved the filing deadline. Uh, we pushed, you know, from April to July. So we'll start to know a little bit more about what that looks like. But we're still probably going to see the consensus revenue estimating group maybe even updating uh, those estimates up a little bit in November. So when they meet in November, we're going to know a lot more and we're going to know a lot more after we're done with seats at the end of July. Uh, even with all of that, though, because uh, we did take that big hit with COVID, you can expect us to look at some sort of revenue enhancements. And of course, a lot of this depends on who we end up electing, right? Because, you know, we have to make sure that we get those things passed. So it would not surprise me to see perhaps a syntax package coming through. I mean, and keep in mind too, when we talk about uh, things that happened in the 70s, um, along with the mainframe, the last time that we raised some of our liquor taxes was in 77. So this is something where you might have it palatable where you could get those votes through. So look for that. Um, if we have, you know, a legislature that's a little bit, you know, less inclined to cut and more inclined to enhance revenue, you could even look at a temporary one to two year income tax surcharge that might add in a new top bracket for, uh, for our higher wage earners. But again, you have to think about what kind of legislature you're working with and if we can get that through. Uh, tax cuts, uh, I would see us doing very targeted ones. So we talk a lot about the food sales tax cuts and for every cent that we take off that we have to find 60 million somewhere else. So look instead for food sales tax rebates. How much time do I have, Deb? Still got more? About one minute. All right, so one minute. Gosh, that's a ton of time when you think about it. All right, so the last thing that I wanted to discuss, I'm uh, happy to be a member of the Interim Committee on Economic Development. And so because of that, that committee will just be do a study committee that will make recommendations to the legislature. We will meet in the fall. I imagine we'd meet virtually, but I've been following the uh, SPARC task force. And so that's our, you know, sort of economic development committee that has legislators, business leaders, and so on. And so looking at our CARES Act funding, um, the state of Kansas has gotten a little over 12 million total. And so uh, as far as our breakdown as to where we're going to use some of that extra federal funding for, uh, for COVID relief, uh, relief, we'll be using most of that in business and community. Uh, local governments get about 99,000 and educational institutions are supposed to get around 200,000. So as we head forward, some of the big things that we'll be looking at is, you know, again, how do we balance the budget? Because that's our main function and that's going to be our main concern. That and how do we bring back the economy in a healthy way after this hit that we've taken due to COVID? So I believe it or not, I am optimistic. So that's kind of where I sit here and thank you so much for letting me talk. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Yeah. And now we have Representative Owsley. Well, good morning, all. And it, yeah, I just realized I was up next as I was sitting thinking about what I was going to say. And as the ladies were running out of time, I thought I could probably yield some of my minutes to them because I just don't have a whole lot this morning. You know, we all know session was cut short, um, you know, towards the end of session when things started getting real and, uh, and the rates started to spike. Um, you know, I got together with the speaker and I was like, we got to get out of here. We're sitting in a cesspool. And I ended up uh, adjourning a little bit before the other session. So when the OP's, uh, OP chamber, you know, uh, scorecard came out the other day, you know, I, I wasn't there to vote on the Ike transportation package. Um, and that was a big deal. And it was a terrible loss for me not to be there, but I felt the safety of my family was more important than any vote that, you know, was going to pass, you know, with me or without me. So, um, I, I ended up, this session was really, uh, cut short for me. Uh, personally, not only did I have things on the table that I was working hard on and making progress with uh, that I that were just abandoned before, you know, be, before the rough adjournment, but um, it uh, impactful, you know, personally here at home too. But um, you know, as always, I I tend to focus on the child welfare. Uh, been ranking member on children and seniors for the last four sessions and. Uh, I've been put on the interim committee for foster care or child welfare oversight. Um, and I haven't spoken with my committee leaders upon that yet, but I've spoken with 
activists and lobbyists that, you know, work within that realm. And I look forward to some good discussions there, you know, in light of the recent headlines coming out of KCK. Uh, Lord knows we still have work we can do uh, to improve upon it. And while I mentioned that, I will just say one of the bills I introduced a couple of years ago was on behalf of the district attorneys from Sedgwick and Johnson and the district attorney from KCK came and testified in favor of it. And that was to improve communications between DCF and law enforcement when complaints or calls concerns had been made, you know, upon individual residencies or families. Um, and uh, so I, I know there's still a lot of work we can do and I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, that interim committee, I believe has been approved for five days, six days. So I'm hoping we can have some lengthy discussions and kind of pick up where we left off uh, when session was cut short because we just weren't able to make the progress. So I miss y'all. Um, it's nice to be here in the comfort of my own home. Um, I have my best dad ever uh, coffee mug. I don't have my baby with me, but they're asleep in the other room. Um, and uh, it's, it's nice to be here with you guys. You guys have seen me from, you know, trembling uh, with my knees knocking up there, not knowing what I'm saying to now we're in the middle of a pandemic and I'm sitting in my office, not knowing what I'm, what I'm going to say to y'all, but I look forward to answering any questions we can this morning. You know, I think every legislator on here is just doing their best to help their constituencies through this pandemic because Lord knows people need help. You know, got an email the other day from a guy who, you know, uh, was approved for unemployment benefits back in February and hasn't seen a dime yet. So these are hard times for everybody and harder times for some. And I think we're all just doing the best we can to A, make sure we're reelected and then B, make sure our constituents, you know, get, get what they need to survive and not wind up, you know, homeless. So look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Deb. Jerry, thank you. you have no idea how important you are in this conversation. So thank you. Deb, go ahead. We have Senator Petty up next. Thanks, Deb, and uh, thanks to the Northeast Johnson County Chamber for having us here today. Uh, it was kind of hard to think about talking about the session because in some ways the session seems like it was so long ago. But the, one of the last bills that we did pass had to do with funding for public education, and that was $92 million. And that uh, does help us keep on track for fair funding. Uh, we know that education, the education industry is so important because uh, one, it prepares uh, our future work, in, uh, work base uh, to be uh, well educated, but also uh, we, we, uh, it's, a, it's an economic engine driver for those employees that work within the system. Um, saying that, I have to say that I am glad that the governor has uh, passing it, or has put forth an executive order to uh, delay the start of school. I think it's important that our children do go back in person, uh, but but in order for that to happen successfully, the those that they work with, the, the teachers and the custodians and the, the cafeteria staff had to feel that they're in a safe environment as well. So um, I, I think the, the saddest thing would be for us to start school and then for buildings to have to shut down um, so if we haven't learned anything, it's that this is a constantly changing time and uh, we have to be open to um, moving forward and accepting um, the changes that are necessary. One of them is being wearing a mask and social distancing. So um, a, an area that I've been involved with a lot is early childhood and, and um, during one of the things that came out of the CARES Act was $30.5 million, $30 million that came to the state to help with child care, help child care providers uh, statewide. And um, it has been a good uh, boost through the, it's called the HEROES uh, Relief Program uh, that DCF manages uh, for our uh, child care, our licensed child care providers. Uh, but at the same time, we've had more child care providers statewide closed down this year than we had in the last four years. So um, we only had 4,000, uh, less than 5,000 licensed child care providers statewide. And so this is a critical issue because as you all in the business industry know, if your employees don't have child care, then they have a hard time uh, being a functioning employee for you on a 
uh, on a regular basis. So I think we have to be very cognizant of that. And I would encourage you to think of all the ways that you can help out in that area. The uh, Family Conservancy is, uh, has uh, organized a task force uh, to look into uh, uh, early child or learning and child care uh, task force. And they will in fact be putting out in the yards of uh, licensed child care providers between July 30th and August 1st, uh, signs thanking them for being uh, uh, essential workers. Uh, another area I wanted to mention was um, the fact that I think uh, the federal government needs to, uh, we know the federal government needs to take uh, lessons from us at the state level on how we handle things. And I think at the state level, we need to be taking lessons about how the cities are addressing equity. And I was very impressed to read that um, the many of the cities in the Northeast area have already started addressing the issue or, or having a statement on equity and having a joint statement with their police department so that it's not, um, doesn't seem like us against them. And uh, I was really impressed to hear about uh, Lenexa looking at tying their um, equity statement to being to their um, development vision, because that means we're, they're really looking at it long term and not just uh, something that's going to be prepared and put on a shelf. It has to have a life and it has to be tied to what's going on. And I think we have to follow that kind of model at the state level as we address this problem or this issue this year in the legislature. Um, the other thing is, I think it's really, I think we should take a lot of uh, pride in the fact that so many people have registered for advanced voting. Um, we have in statewide over almost 300,000 people have requested advanced voting ballots and in Johnson County you know that your numbers, the numbers are um, 90,000. So that means that people are interested in the uh, election process and they're going to get out there and they're going to vote and they're not going to be ham hampered by uh, not being able to go to the polls. So um, I hope you encourage others to uh, register for advanced voting if they haven't done so already. Um, it's a safe, it's a secure system, and we know that it works in Kansas because we've been doing it, uh, and uh, there's no reason for people to say that it's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, can be, it's not safe. It, it does have a paper trail. Um, let's see, the other thing I wanted to mention. You have about one more minute. Okay, um, I I think I would want to follow up with Jarrett mentioning about um, child welfare and the fact that, of course, that this um, young child, Olivia, that was murdered by her father is happened just uh, a, a mile from where I live. In fact, actually, uh, her body was found just a block from where I used to live. So uh, it's very close um, in my community. I, I think it's just another example, uh, sadly, of domestic violence and, and how important it is for us to continue um, to um, make efforts at the state level to put in as many pieces of legislation we can that can help protect, to, can help with domestic violence and protect our children, but also give uh, other family members the tools that they can to assist when, there's, when they uh, see those red flags. Um, I am on the mental health modernization committee uh, tasks for this uh, interim. And um, of course, that's a piece of this as well. Uh, it will be interesting to see where that goes. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I know we've been doing lots of things at the local level, and I hope that we looked for different ways to work outside of the box as we, or, and also take advantage of all those, the work that's already gone for it from our our mental health departments and from our school districts so we capitalize on that and we just don't try to reinvent the wheel again. Thank you so much for all of your comments. Um, we're going to go to Representative Stog still. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, really glad to be here. It's nice to see you all on Zoom, but I really look forward when we can all be in the same room again. I don't know about anybody else, but I just miss shaking people's hands for heaven's sakes. 
I think my wife is getting a little tired of me shaking her hands for like making breakfast in the morning. So uh, uh, anyway, hopefully we'll all be back soon. But a uh, couple things that I wanted to talk about this morning. One was to uh, thank our teachers and our administrators, custodians, all of that sort of thing who are having to work uh, through this pandemic and provide different types of uh, educational experiences for our kids here in Shawnee Mission and across the state. Uh, we are asking them to do yeoman's work and doing things that they've never done before. And uh, I think they uh, deserve a, a, a big, big round of credit for that. Uh, the reason I, I premise that is because uh, it brings up a subject that's near and dear to my heart and which I've been working on for four years. First bill that I introduced <clears throat> in the house when I came up in 17 was to restore due process rights to every teacher in Kansas. They had had those rights for decades up until 2014 when in the middle of the night on the last day of the session, they were ripped out. And uh, without a hearing, uh, without a committee meeting, uh, without any kind of proper debate on the floor, uh, they were just gone. And uh, all the due process guarantees those people that they cannot be fired for some type of unjust cause. <clears throat> and right now, I think with the uh, uh, with the things that they're going through and everything, and we are really putting the lives of our kids in their hands, and we're we're willing to do that because we know we have fantastic teachers across the state, and I think it's definitely time to give them their due process rights back. Um, we I I've, I've gotten it uh, through the house twice, but only by amendment because the leadership in the House has not wanted that topic brought up and they have refused to give it uh, uh, hearings in on the Education Committee, which I've served on for the last four years. I think this coming year, uh, we owe those teachers the, uh, uh, the ability to get those due process rights back. And if I'm back in Topeka on January, that's the first bill I'm going to introduce again. So anyway, that's, uh, that's something I, I hope we can look forward to. <clears throat> Another issue that came up in uh, federal and state affairs this year, which I think would have passed uh, had it been uh, uh, run correctly all the way through to the end of the session, was the legalization of medical cannabis. And we had uh, good hearings on that. Uh, I think it would have uh, passed our committee uh, if, uh, if we would have had time and, and been able to work that bill and so on. And I think actually from talking to people on both sides of the aisle up there, I think it would have passed uh, the House as well. And uh, it, the, the main thing was is that anything that we can offer doctors to, uh, as an alternative possibly to uh, prescribing opioids, is something that we definitely ought to give a, uh, uh, a strong look to. So I'm hoping that that comes up again this year and uh, or next year and that we are able to uh, act on that. Um, the uh, third area that uh, I introduced a couple of bills uh, this last year was to uh, help reduce the, uh, the incidence of uh, gun violence in Kansas. And uh, our friends in the gun lobby and so on, they say that, uh, you know, it's not guns that kill people, it's people that kill people and that what we need is more uh, mental health programs and facilities and so on that can deal with some of these folks before they get to the point where they're going out and creating violence with, with a weapon. And so I introduced a bill that uh, added a 5% excise tax uh, onto the sale of guns and ammunition with every nickel of that money that's raised earmarked for improving our mental health programs and facilities. And the response was they wouldn't even give it a hearing. So uh, I found that to be a little bit hypocritical, but uh, uh, it is something that uh, I think needs to be addressed in ways that uh, does not impact our hunting uh, industry in Kansas, our target shooters, that sort of thing. But there are ways that we can uh, address gun violence in Kansas without taking people's guns away. And that was certainly one of them. And it would certainly have helped our mental health programs and institutions. Um, the second bill that I had was to uh, uh, limit handgun magazine capacities. And that became very apparent uh, here in Prairie Village when uh, a year or so ago, the uh, young man uh, shot up Highlands Elementary School. 
And when I saw the video of that, I noticed that he had a, a high capacity extended magazine in that handgun. Probably had 30, 40, 50 rounds possibly in that magazine. And I thought, this is ridiculous. That There's no reason for that. So I introduced a bill that would have uh, limited those uh, uh, those types of magazines that they could not extend down below the uh, grip of a handgun. Uh, one, it would have limited, it would have only limited some handguns to 17 rounds. And uh, uh, that I think is probably sufficient for most people. And, Representative uh, Sidestill, thank you. Yes. Let's, let's go on to Representative okay. Shoup. We're gonna go to questions, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone. Uh, apologies if you hear some vague baby noises in the background. My wife's working right now, so I got extra duty. She's being fed right now, so she should be happy. Uh, the first thing I wanted to touch on is higher ed funding. So we did pass $3 billion for higher ed um, with $865 million from, from SGF. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to include $68 million um, in enhancement requests from the Board of Regents, but we did uh, add money for Excel and Career Technical Ed, which I think is really good for our, our technical learning students. Um, and, and the Board of Regents did receive a sizable increase in 2022. So again, we can't give them everything, but, but over the last two years, um, the entire term, we were able to do something. Something that's really cool, I think that not a lot of people know about, we heard this in committee, but it actually got added in in the budget process, is that we were able to add um, language that any member of a Kikapu tribe or Potawatomi nation, uh, Iowa tribe or Sac and Fox nation, they can be declared uh, in-state residents for the purposes of tuition. So even if they live in Iowa or Nebraska, if they're a member of that tribe, they can get in-state tuition at our universities, which I think is really, really cool. Um, the second thing I wanted to touch on and on brand for me, I think is the environment. So I was able to add in a, uh, or introduce a climate crisis resolution that I think many people here ended up uh, signing up on. Um, it didn't go anywhere, but honestly, we had more conversations, I think in these two years, uh, about the climate than, than we had previously. For example, we had a bipartisan, kind of an informal climate change hearing put on by a climate and energy project and, and some of our friends in the environmentalist groups. Um, and so it was bipartisan, it was really great, it was an hour and a half long, and we just heard from a lot of experts in the field on how climate change is gonna affect Kansas, and, and, and it really will. Um, two of the biggest things that happened legislatively there, or non-legislatively there, is first of all, they disapproved um, the Kansas Energy Office that the governor proposed. Uh, this was recommended by a, an electric rate study that the Republican majority wanted, um, but they decided that it was too political <laughs> to let the uh, governor get what she wanted. Um, so they disapproved it. I think they're open to the idea in general, but they there are debates on, on whether that's housed under the KCC or directly under the governor or uh, under some other office. So I think we'll see that come back at some point. Um, it's not just a straight out disapproval, but I would have preferred it to get done this year so we can get started on a state energy plan. The second thing, hold on, let me get it. The second thing is that the Supreme Court ruled that the solar demand charges were unconstitutional. Um, that So that the KCC is gonna hear a new rate plan. So hopefully that will not impose um, additional fees on our solar users. I, I think we really need to boost up residential solar here in Kansas. Uh, the third thing that I want to talk about is I think that the governor implemented a lot of great ideas via executive order um, through with the COVID pandemic that I think we need to just kind of extend into law. She kind of just ripped the bandaid off of things that we've talked about for a really long time. So um, notaries not requiring personal experiences or ex personal um, appearances. So um, with Missouri passing their absentee law, right, that requires a notary, I think that's really prohibitive and, and at least not requiring personal appearances, I think would help with that. Uh, telemedicine is a big one that I think we need to just extend the law. Carry out martinis, I think is very popular. And then the last thing I wanna to touch on that I think is relevant right now very much is childcare. Um, I think we've noticed that, that, you know, our economies, both personal and uh, nationally is dependent on childcare, right? It's built around two incomes in the family. And, and um, we've noticed in the school conversation how many of our parents are dependent on schools for childcare, which, you know, is, is okay for the most part, but when we're in a pandemic like this and there's nowhere for, for our children of our essential uh, employees to go, 
I think that's really, really harmful. So I think we need to have a larger national conversation about childcare. I also think we need a larger national conversation about healthcare too. We're in the midst of a, a pandemic, right? And six million people have lost their healthcare due to the recession caused by the pandemic. And, and so it, it seems, you know, in, in policy, there's this idea of automatic stabilizers, right? Where economic benefits kick in when economic, um, kind of the economic environment declines. Losing healthcare in a pandemic recession is kind of the opposite of that. It's kind of a snowball effect. So I think we need to have kind of a larger conversation about how to decouple healthcare from um, employment. So with that and a very upset baby, I'll, I'll cede my time. Thank you so much. All of you had such great things to offer this morning. Um, I'm not sure that we have any questions that haven't been answered. Is there anything else that we'd like to talk about because otherwise we have a few minutes left. We could go back to some of the uh, officials and see if there's anything they'd like to add. Well, one, one of the things that was asked is, does the um, tax include where, uh, I guess it's medical marijuana. That's one of the things it says, um, does the sin tax include mer mer you know, medical marijuana? That, that was addressed to you. I would be happy to speak to that. Uh, at current, when I talk about a sin tax package, I mean primarily taxes related to liquor and tobacco. Now, if we did put medicinal cannabis in place, I couldn't really see us taxing medicinal, right? Because, you know, it's, you know, would be viewed as medicine. If we put recreational into place, I would not vote for recreational cannabis unless it was taxed heavily, because my main motivation to support that would be as a revenue source. And so can't speak for my other colleagues, but, um, but that's, you know, just seeing the difference between medicinal and recreational. Thank you. Well said. Um, can, one question is, is everyone's wanting to know what the mask thing is. I mean, what's your recommendation on mask? And I know what mine is, but I don't want to. <laughs> so can, can someone talk about that? You know, I, I'd be uh, very happy to say, you know, I think uh, we're doing exactly the right thing with these mandatory masks. I think there's enough scientific evidence out there that shows that that is one way that we can control this and probably the easiest way to control it. And I, I very disappointed in seeing people to think that's an infringement on their freedoms. I think that is just something that we do that is medically sound and it is out of respect uh, for the health and, and well-being of our neighbors and friends and family and so on. So uh, I applaud the governor's efforts to uh, make this statewide, and I think it's going across the nation, and I think there's a lot of support for that, not only in Kansas, but nationally. And, uh, you know, there's always going to be some people that are going to try to fight it, but uh, uh, I think we're on the right path there. I agree with you, Jerry. Jared, what's your opinion? I, I actually took some notes today. I wanted to thank the business community for supporting the mask, you know, uh, wearing requirement mandate uh, request because it's one of the best ways we can fight it and I think it's nice to see business owners such as the RJ barbecue you know uh, he just recently you know uh, was in the paper because his business life depends upon the safety of his employees and customers and he understands the business aspect of the safety aspect so I, I just want to thank the business community for stepping up and helping me a part of taking the politics out of it and just putting the reality in, so. Okay, well, IKEA reached out to the Chamber of Commerce yesterday and they asked us about it and I said, no, I mean, even though you're six feet apart, you still need to wear a mask. Miss Barbara, can you give us an opinion? Yes. And very definitely. And one of the things I wanna help people understand, the reason no one knew at the beginning, did we need masks or not, is because this was a new virus. No one knew anything about it. And we have been learning over time. And we have studied and looked and found that yes, these particles come out of our mouths and they hang in the air. And believe me, I, 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 if you aren't like me being on Zoom all the time and having a light, you can see it now. I, I didn't notice that before, but when we speak, we exude, particles uh, uh, of that are, are carry virus if we have it and 
this is the best thing that we can do is wear a mask to prevent not only the spread to others, they've also found that it protects you. Your mucous membranes are what uh, the virus enters through. So now, not only with masks, the recommendation is going to also include people should be wearing something over their eyes, glasses of some kind, also will help. So if you're in close proximity, your eyes are also a place that a virus can enter. And so you should be aware of that. They're not gonna mandate glasses, because it's not uh, putting out, but for you, for your own protection, that would be a good idea. And you know, this is just about loving one another. How simple, put on a mask uh, and take care because you don't know who you want to give it to, who is somebody else that they're with is at high risk uh, of, of a health condition that would cause them to potentially die. And we don't know the ultimate sequela of virus. It's like chicken pox. You can ultimately end up with shingles from it, right? We don't talk about that. We don't know what may come from coronavirus down the pipe. We've never had it before. So we want to protect ourselves. Thanks, Stoney. Thank you. Ms. Stephanie, your opinion? Thank you, Stoney. Um, you know, I think a lot of times when we look at different policies, it's the same thing with Medicaid expansion. Uh, sometimes people get there from different places. So there are lots of people who get to the mask point by, oh, I'm going to be a decent human being and protect my fellow man. Um, but not everyone gets to policy that way. I think that ultimately we look at our bottom line and uh, we look at, you know, do businesses want to make money? Can you make money when people are too sick or too dead to buy things? No, logically we cannot. So I think if we look at preserving our bottom line and preserving our economy, that you wear a mask to support the economy. And so we've done a lot of, a lot more heavy, heavier lifting, right? To make sure that our local economy is doing well. Um, so if you put the thing on your face, then, you know, that should hopefully help things out. Um, also kind of looking forward to the new fashion aspects. I am, uh, may or may not have been looking at my favorite handbag designer waiting to see when they come out with a line of masks. I mean, these are opportunities here. So, um, you know, change is not always terrible. And I think that we're very adaptable. And again, and to echo Representative Owsley's previous statements, I really like seeing the business community getting in on this and normalizing it because so it's so much easier for people to trust private businesses than it is in some places, uh, in some ways to see what government is doing because uh, you know they understand that Costco, in fact, it makes more sense for them to have people mask. And so it doesn't look like oppression to them. So this is a heavy lift that has to be done both through government and through business. And I'm so grateful to all of you for what you have been doing to normalize this. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pat, Pat Patty, your opinion? Oh, I absolutely support masks. Um, I, and I, I think it's a, what's happening is a good example of sometimes somebody has to be the heavy. And in this case, it's, it's government, it's our governor, um, who's shown a remarkable leadership throughout this whole uh, pandemic, from shutting down schools uh, early uh, to now uh, mandating state, uh, mass statewide. There is the local, uh, you know, local levels uh, opportunity to say they don't want to do it. And unfortunately, 90 of our counties out of our 105 counties have uh, said, have not followed that mandate. They've said, uh, we recommend it, but they haven't mandated it. And some of their cities have, have said just the opposite. So um, I, I think there's a very, if anybody ever says, which my neighbors actually just said this to me yesterday, uh, about um, masks not doing their job, we can watch Bill Nye, the, the science guy, and uh, he has a very good, uh, I'm sure it's on YouTube, about how, you know, what a mask does. Uh, just as uh, Senator Boyer said. So um, I think that many, I think, thank the businesses for uh, taking this on and supporting it and not standing in the way of, because it's an economic, it's an economic tool. It helps to keep your business open. And um, I, I do believe that as businesses uh, 
uh, move forward with supporting uh, mask in their establishment, it will, will, will help to normalize it. I've just got to add one thing because I thought this was interesting and maybe you saw it too. But when right before the 4th of July, um, there was a, here was a, here was a stand selling uh, fireworks and then just right there next to it was a tent selling masks. So, uh, and they might still be there. It's uh, on Metropolitan Avenue in, in Kansas City, Kansas. But I thought, okay, this is somebody uh, talk about uh, driving the economy and taking advantage of the situation. That's what they were doing, selling masks. Well, thank you, Ms. Betty. Uh, I'd like to turn it over right now to the president of the Northeast Johnson County Chamber of Commerce, Ms. Deb Settle. Well, I think that we are very fortunate and blessed to have the elected officials that we do in Northeast Johnson County. And Senator Boyer, I, I, um, words are almost hard to come up with to tell you how thankful we are for all of your leadership that you have shown us for the past years and how much we have appreciated your willingness to step into some of the, the fights that were pretty hard to fight. Um, you, you've always been such a gracious leader and so appreciative of it. Thank you, Deb. I love this community. I love this state. And uh, it's been a very huge honor and privilege to serve people and to get to know them. That's the best part of all this. Uh, now I know y'all, so it's good. You know, what is really interesting as I watch you on television, I, I know that lady and I get to call her my friend. And it is so wonderful that we can build those kinds of relationships and, and you just continue to do what you're doing. Well, and that's all what, of uh, you know, that's what public service is all about. And what I love and, and thank back to the chamber is the opportunity. Uh, there are so many opportunities for us to know one another and to continue the conversation, which is the most important part. It's not about a once a year meeting. It's about a continual, hearing, listening, and understanding, and moving, trying to move forward together. So you all do a great job, and uh, it's a privilege, truly, uh, to have this as our, I, and you know, Deb, I'm going to brag on you, this, this organization has come a long way since I was first in office, uh, and uh, I'm really proud to see my community uh, grow so much in a, in a chamber of conference way. It's, it's very impressive, so thanks to you all. Thank you. Senator Petty, I want to reach out and tell you personally thank you because I reached out. We had a member that has really been having a hard time and you took it by the horns and have been leading that charge for us. Um, and again, that's where the personal relationships come in because you have been so involved, all of you. I, we know all we have to do is pick up the telephone or send a quick email and we have a very quick response. Each and every one of you brings so much strength and talent to our legislature, and I am so proud of each of you. And again, very appreciative of what you do for all of our constituents. Is there any closing remarks that any of you'd like to make or any questions that we haven't covered? Well, that's a silly question. There's lots of questions out there. I might just add that I, I know that uh, a couple of us have mentioned uh, interims that we're going to be on um, this uh, uh, leading up to the legislative session. So uh, if any of the uh, members of the Northeast Johnson County Chamber have issues um, dealing specifically in my case, it would be I'm on the mental health modernization um, or points that they want to bring up. Um, you know, I, I hope you'll reach out to uh, any of us, but um, I'm on that. Stephanie mentioned what she's on. I don't. I can't remember from other perspectives what everybody's on. I'm on the mental health one as well. I'm on economic recovery. We'll probably be talking. Well, give us an update on mental health right now. Can you? Well, we haven't started meeting yet, so okay. I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> we will be starting very soon on our legislative agenda 
for this coming year. So I, I will be reaching out and asking opinions. And then once we have something put together, um, we always want to get that out to you so that you understand exactly where our positions are. So we'll move forward as we have in the past. But I think with that, we're going to say thank you. Have a good rest of your summer and um, stay safe and healthy. And again, thank you. Thank you all.